All right, welcome back to Context and Clarity Live. If you are new around here, uh, we've been saying this for a few weeks now, so I think we're, this theme is sort of running out. I keep saying new look and, and things like this, but um, this is Context and Clarity Live. I don't know if it's new anymore. Uh, we're getting into the swing of things, but if you've never been here before, uh, we spend an hour, no matter what your context is, looking for clarity around something in the business of architecture, in the business of architecture, engineering, construction, somehow. We have special guests every week, and I'm joined every week by my co-host, Katie Kangas. Welcome, Katie. Glad you're here today. Good to be here. Excited for this conversation with Blair. I am too. This is, uh, I, I say this over and over, and this is not to butter up our, our guests because we've already talked about this, but um, we are going to talk to Blair Inns here in just a, just a minute. He's the author of, I'm ruining the opening already, but he's the author of Win Without Pitching, which I keep saying is required reading for architects all over the world. And I've said this before, when I've put on the management consulting hat with my clients, uh, I require the team that I'm working with to read Win Without Pitching before we begin working, because I think it's an important mindset um, to adopt uh, the the uh, proclamations that are in in the book. And we'll certainly get into that with Blair here in just a few minutes, but really looking forward to this conversation today. So welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, wherever you are, uh, say hi when you get here. Let us know that you're here and then let us know where here is for you. Where are you joining this conversation from? I see Mark R. LePage is in first today. He's in Waxhaw, North Carolina. He says, hello, friends. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday to you, Mark, and everybody else. Uh, Scott Thrift, Says it's a gray day on the bay. He's in San Francisco. He's joining us over on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining us today, Scott. Great to see you. Chris is in Massachusetts. He says, good afternoon. Looking forward to the conversation. And his friend, his neighbor, Wendy Brown, is in Western Massachusetts. So uh, not being super familiar with the geography of Massachusetts. I think we've gone from central to Western there with Chris and, uh, and Wendy. Jessica, welcome back from Los Angeles. She's preparing for a meeting there. Rick Lindley, welcome from Winnipeg. All right. There's a nice tie-in to today. Glad you're here, Rick. Uh, Rick's joining us from LinkedIn, and I see several joining us on Facebook. If you're on Facebook right now and you are uh, commenting away and going, hey, why is my comment not showing up like Jessica's or like Wendy's or Chris's or, or Mark's, it is likely because you are in a closed Facebook group. Uh, we stream to a couple of closed groups there on Facebook. And it turns out Mark Zuckerberg doesn't like to share your personal information, um, at least if he can't make a profit on it. So uh, there are some rules in place that may have just gotten us kicked off of Facebook, by the way. <laughs> but but uh, there are some rules that say that your name, your likeness, your comments can't escape that Facebook group unless you give permission. And so there is a URL in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen right now. Open up another browser window. Type chat.restream.io slash FB, like Facebook. That's chat.restream.io slash FB. And a couple of clicks later, and you will give Facebook that permission to communicate with Restream, which is what we use here for these, our simulcast, as we call this. We're streaming out to Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch um, to our big audience over there on, on Twitch, certainly. So glad to have you all with us. But if you're having trouble from Facebook, type chat.restream.io slash FB. And a couple of clicks later, that should solve your problem. Your chats, your comments should show up on the screen. So um, glad you're all here today. I feel like I've forgotten something already, Katie. What, what, what have I forgotten? <laughs> well, I think those uh, win without pitching is more than just a mindset. It's really an oh, empowering definitely. way to approach marketing. And so, uh, yeah, I think you got the the laundry done and covered. And Did get all get all the check marks. I think so. All right. Yeah. All right. Good enough. Well, we'll we will do our intro here momentarily. Great to have you all with us. Uh, Chris says he hopes Jessica is not pitching. So. Um, maybe, maybe Jessica can get some tips as she's preparing to, uh, as she's preparing to present whatever it is that she's about to present. Elizabeth, welcome back from San Diego. Glad you're here joining us today. All right. Our guest today is an author, a trainer, and a coach. 
He's on a mission to change the way creative and professional services are bought and sold. And I know when I said that, bought and sold, that may have raised the uh, the hair on the back of your neck. You are, after all, most of you are architects, so I get that. But he's he's here to change the way your services are bought and sold. That's what happens, by the way. Uh, he's the co-host of the popular podcast with David Baker, Two Bobs conversations on the art of creative entrepreneurship and he's the author of pricing creativity a guide to profit beyond the billable hour and the win without pitching manifesto he's the founder of the sales training and coaching organizations win without pitching blair ends welcome to context and clarity live thank you jeff thank you katie glad to have you i'm happy to be here it's great to have you here and you traveled a long way Relative to Indianapolis, at least, you've traveled a long way to get here. So wh- where are you exactly? Well, it was a five-minute drive from my house to my studio, so it wasn't that long. I'm in uh, Caslow, British Columbia, Canada. So if you know Vancouver, I'm a short 11-hour drive from Vancouver. <laughs> that's, that's uh, yeah, five minutes isn't bad, is it? Yeah, we're not even a town. We're uh, Technically, we're a village of okay. 976 people. Okay. Population's gone up. Since your interview with Mark, it was just 900 back then. <laughs> was it? <laughs> <laughs> well, they've, they've been proliferating. It ebbs so. and yeah. flows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> COVID, COVID happened and uh, and drove the population up. There you go. Yeah, it did indeed, actually. Yeah. I'm sure it did. Nice. Well, it's it's great to have you here. And, um, you know, as you know, as we talked about, um, I, I really think that um, what you have written, not only in Win Without Pitching, but certainly Pricing Creativity as well. I think it's very, very important um, for our audiences, for people that provide the services that we're talking about, um, certainly architects, but but beyond. I know that you focus or or, or uh, help people in all over creative and professional services. So um, what what do you think, you know, this is, this is certainly a loaded question. It's a big question, but what do you think is the, the biggest threat to um, what essentially are small business owners, right? All, all of the, the small firm architects um, that make up this community are small business owners. What do you think is the biggest threat to their livelihoods um, when we think about how they do business? Oh, yeah. I mean, we could talk about topical things. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that's top of mind for me these days is payment terms. I don't know how much, uh, if you're a residential architecture, you're probably not running into that. But if you're doing work for corporations, you might be running into longer and longer payment terms. Um, I don't know. I'm a big fan of the small business owner of entrepreneurial businesses. I think, um, I think they tend to be more resilient than larger companies in some ways. I remember a a friend of mine who owned an ad agency, uh, a very small ad agency said to me years ago, uh, it was probably around 2008. He said, our recessions are for other people. We're um, in in a small business. Um, You know, the the market's just so big that it just means you have to work harder. Now, I I think that might be true in a marketing um, services business. It's far less likely to be true in an architectural business because of, um, you know, when we head into a, a, a down economy or even a recession, you know, sometimes building just stops, right? So that that type of spending just grinds to a halt. So I wouldn't say that's the case for architects, but I do like the f- flexibility that is afforded uh, to small business owners. As long as you have cash in the bank, as long as you have your basic business fundamentals down, um, I would say most periods, and I think we're in one right now, I'm, I'm taking the temperature of our clients and my, my peers who also sell into this space to get a sense of what's going on. And there's definitely, there's no panic in the market right now, but there's definitely a softening. There's a conservatism on the client side. Um, sales cycles that used to be X are now 1.5 or 2X. So there's just a lot of caution on the client side. So a big rambling answer to your question, Jeff, but I think you know, the real threat to um, small business owners is from within. It's, um, especially if you're a creative, like an architect, you decide, okay, I'm a, 
I, you study as an architect, you identify as an architect. This is what I love to do. This is what I was put on this earth to do, perhaps. Um, and so you decide to go out on your own and launch your own business. And I would say the, the, um, the lesson that is not learned fast enough is to upskill on the basic business uh, skills. Uh, so I think when we go into a downturn like we are now, the most threatened small businesses are the ones that A, don't have enough cash in the bank and B, uh, don't have a sense of the fundamentals of the business, of the financials. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. And if we... I, I would imagine everybody in the audience kind of agrees with that. It's we talk about that from time to time as you know, as as architects, and it, it's true in other professional services as well. Um, you you get trained in your craft, right? You get trained in in um, uh, what it takes to become an architect, not in the business of architecture. That's that seems to be a gap um, for almost all of us. So when if the sales cycle is, has gone from X to 1.5 or to two. And, and um, for those of you that, uh, that don't like sales, for those of you that, that, that um, you know, some of these conversations may be a little bit foreign to you. One of the things that, that the rest of us will talk about is the fact that time kills deals. So if, if we've gone from X to 1.5 or, or that sales cycle is starting to extend or, you know, maybe to translate for the folks in the audience, hey, you sent out a proposal, which is probably something we ought to talk about, but you sent out a proposal and you used to get a response in a couple of days and now it's been a couple of weeks or, you know, whatever that timing looks like. What do we do? What do we do to remedy the fact that that sales cycle is, uh, is extending? And that's, that tees you up for, <laughs> for it's kind of a softball, but, um, but what do you what do you do to remedy when things are slowing down and it the the process isn't working as well as it it did a couple of months ago maybe? Yeah, I'll speak to that. And I'm just a placeholder, so I remind both of us or the three of us to come back to this subject of the S word. Um, <clears throat> We use that word once you're in the room here, but I, I yeah. find in my own business, if I send out um, an email that's got the S word in the subject line, the open rates just mm -hmm. plummet because a lot of my target market think, well, we're not really in sales. We're kind of in, we do business development. We don't do sales. Sales right. is a dirty word. So let's come back to that. Yeah. Um, I think your question was, what do you do now in the face of extended sales cycle? So an extended sales cycle might be um, increased time in which you hear back from a written proposal, but it, it's really just the length of time from the when you process, start yeah. talking to the client to the when they make yeah. a decision. Yeah. And um, the common mistake that we make when deals go dark or slow or slow down and we start to lose momentum. And as you said, Jeff, time kills deals, especially late stage deals after the client has decided, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to hire an architect like you, not necessarily you, but like you. And I'm going to go ahead with this project. So after this intent, uh, momentum is really important. And so the tendency is... Um, just irrespective of you know whatever the macroeconomic conditions are, whether it's good times or bad times, the tendency is when things start to slow down and a deal goes dark. And we've had this, you know, if you've been in business long enough, you've had this happen probably multiple times. You're talking to a prospective client who's very enthusiastic and really excited about the possibility of working with you. It seems like it's you and only you. They're either not talking to somebody else or they've already eliminated those alternatives. So it feels like you're, they're going ahead with you. They might even say, okay, you're, you're my person. We're, we're going to do this. We're going to work together. Send me your proposal. And then, so everything's proceeding to a close and then you don't hear from them. I'll get back to you in a couple of days and they don't. And then you reach out, Hey, just checking in. How's, you know, any, you know, I hope you had a great weekend. All these like fake niceties, faux niceties about, <clears throat> Uh, hey, what about the proposal? So that happens fairly often. And it's 
it's a function of, um, we all know what buyer's remorse is. It's the remorse we make after we make a big purchase decision, but that actually sets in before the client decides, after they form the intent and before they say yes, before they commit. <clears throat> so that's why momentum is really important in late stage opportunities. If you leave somebody alone long enough, they start to think of all the reasons why this might not work or the costs, the costs or the consequences of failure. And our tendency in that, those situations is just to, to plaster the fake smile on our face and leave these voicemail messages and send these texts that are overly polite. And we, what we don't appreciate is our, our um, you know, the, the client, when we're leaning on this personal stuff, hey, hope, hope, hope everyone, hope, how are your kids? You know, all this stuff that is taught in some schools of selling. Um, what you're doing is you're, um, you're imbuing the decision the client has to make with this excess emotional weight. Mm -hmm. So they have a, you can think of it like a computer. They have this decision that they've got to make. What are the pros and cons, et cetera. But it's a wet computer that's prone to these things called emotions. And buying a big purchase, especially you know, hiring an architect, designing your probably the first home that you've had built for yourself, et cetera, um, that's a big emotional decision fraught with all kinds of risk. So you imagine this person has gone dark. You imagine that they're afraid. They have this fear of making a mistake. And we keep reaching out to talk to them. And the fact that they don't want to communicate back means that they're, they're afraid of, they're afraid to give us honest feedback. And the reason the client's afraid to give us honest feedback typically is we have imbued too much emotions into the sale. We've been too needy. We've wanted this too bad. So we keep checking in and the client just retreats further and further and further into their cave. So I like the approach of at some point you have to realize, all right, this thing's stalled. It's either not happening or they've hired somebody else. And so, and maybe Shannon's talked about this before. We have this magic email. You basically send them a note saying, hey, I, I get it. You, um, I haven't heard back from you this project. I'm going to assume that you've gone with somebody else or your priorities have changed. If um, you know where we are, if we can be of help in, this, in the future, feel free to reach out. And we call that the takeaway email or the closing the loop email or the million dollar email because it generates a lot of money, not like collectively across a lot of people who've done it. The power of that email is in one stroke, in one simple email, you, you basically say, hey, I get it. Um, uh, this, you, you're, you're no longer doing this. You hired somebody else. It's, I get it. It's, it's, it's just business. You've made a business decision. It's not personal. So in, you, in one stroke, you, you remove the emotions that you have imbued into the decision and you walk away. And what that email is really good at doing is eliciting a response. So the response is either, yeah, we've hired your biggest competitor or yeah, we've hired. It's the response is the truth. Here's what's really going on. We've hired somebody else or we've just shelved this project. And if the truth is that they're just paralyzed because this is a difficult decision, there's a lot at risk here. <clears throat> You're, I, I can't call you, the client feels like, oh, I can't call you and talk, get you to talk me through this because you, you're so invested in this deal. You're not going to give me an unbiased point of view. You're going to try to talk me into hiring you. If that's the reality, by retreating, you will see them advance. They'll say, no, wait, don't go. So the response will be, hey, sorry, I've just been busy. Yeah, um, I'll sign the... Sometimes it's, I'll sign the proposal, but more often it's, I just, uh, can, can we set up a time to talk? So it unsticks a stuck deal. That's the first thing I would have you think about is this idea of, have you been a little bit too needy in the sale? Have you imbued too many emotions into the decision? And can you remove those emotions by saying something like, Hey, I get it. You're going with somebody else or, or this is no longer a priority. No problem. Uh, if we can help in the future, feel free to reach out. So it's not, I will call you in the future. It's basically, I get it. It's business. You made a business decision. We're all adults here. I'm moving on. But the door's still open if we can help in the future. And there's something about that email. It was taught to me over 20 years ago as a voicemail. But there's something about that email that just removes the emotions from that situation. 
and elicits the truth from the client. And if the truth is that they're stuck, there's usually an invitation to proceed in some form to resume the conversation. So that's, if I had to offer one thing, that would be it. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. I mean, and I think to many of us, that might be completely counterintuitive because one, you know, how many, I'll, I'll raise my hand to this, how many of us have acted out of desperation, you know, especially small business owners, wow, where's the next project going to come from? Um, I'm kind of desperate to get this one, or I really want this one or whatever. But also I think um, with many, many clients in this world, there's so much emotion wrapped up in the project itself. Yeah. Right. Oh, this is our dream home. This is our beach home. This is the the first office where, you know, we've actually had someone design it or our first restaurant, you know, whatever those things are. And I think it can be hard to, to pull those things apart. Um, so I, I think that's, that's really great advice. Um, I think it may Chris be, is, it may be counterintuitive, uh, Jeff, but it's not just think it through. You're, it's not going to kill a good deal. It's not going to kill right. an otherwise, it's just going to re reveal information. Yeah. So well, as uncomfortable it, as it may feel or sound, go ahead yeah. and try it. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think that idea of revealing information is, is really sort of the, the key to everything that you talk about in one without pitching, isn't it? It's, this is about gathering information and understanding um, which also is, uh, yeah, it, it seems like it would be natural to me. It seems like it would be natural for us to think that way, but I don't think we proceed in that way when we're, Oh, you know, here they are. We've got to convince them, uh, you know, all of these things that we think we have to do, but, but that's not the approach of, of win without pitching really. No, one of the proclamations in the manifesto is um, conversations instead of presentations. There's something about all of the creative professions where we go into presentation mode. We get in front of a client, we start showing off our stuff. And I'm not saying we shouldn't show off our previous work, but we go into this mode where we're transmitting and not receiving. And I'm fond of saying you can present to people or you can be present to them, but you can't do both. You have to pick one. And I think if you want to move away from you know what we kind of alluded to before, this idea of selling is talking people into the things and towards this place of selling is helping or facilitating, then you can't have high sunk costs. You can't be emotionally over-invested in the deal. You can't be over-invested in time and money because once you are, you can no longer be this pragmatic facilitator of a conversation that really is about what's best for the client. And that's how you want to approach selling. You, we're, we're all such good conversationalists. Like you wouldn't get to where you are in your, in your life or your professional career without being good at conversation. But there's something that changes. There's a switch in our brain that flicks when, the, when we move to sales, when money gets involved. And if there's just one thing I could do for you, the audience, if I could wave a magic wand, I would just, I would just remove whatever baggage you have in your mind about what it means to sell. I would just remove it all, everything you've ever heard about selling. If I could just take it away, and just say you're good enough, you'll do. You just show up and be you. Show up and have a conversation. Your job is to help this person, and if helping means them hiring you, great. If it means you referring them to somebody else, great. Just show up and help. Be yourself. Keep it conversational. And as soon as you go into presentation mode, you, uh, you're transmitting, you quit receiving. It becomes very obvious to the client. And if the client sees you transmitting and not receiving, if they see you in presentation mode, that's a sign that, okay, well, you, really, you really want this. That means you're less likely to get honest information coming back. So the whole... Our, our framework, I think Shannon may have talked about this, our framework that uh, um, underpins all of our training is this idea of the four conversations. There are four conversations in the sale. Whether there are or not is immaterial. It's a, it's a model that's useful. Um, but throughout the entire arc of the sale, it's all conversational. So if you're retreating to write a proposal, if you're, if you're showing up to the wow moment where you want to wow the client you're withholding information in advance so you can uh, 
do the big reveal. All of these things are signs that you're not keeping it conversational. And there are some things that are just built into the way architects work and sell that are um, contrary to this. So it's a bit of a mindset shift. And then you have to figure out, okay, what's the application of this mind mindset? Can, can you share with us what those four conversations are? Sure. So the first conversation is, we call it the probative conversation. And it's where you prove your expertise to the client and you move in their mind from this position of vendor to a position of expert. So we make this helpful generalization that there are only two positions you can occupy in your relationships with your clients and prospective clients. You can be seen as a vendor with numerous direct substitutes. So you have little power in the buy-sell relationship. Or you can be seen as the expert. You're seen as meaningfully different and you have some power to push back on the sale. And the key to the probative, pro, probative conversation is that it happens without you present. So it is really a function of your reputation. So, so the probative conversation is had through your agents of referrers, those best, those best clients who refer work to you. And then it might be thought leadership if you're publishing. It might be, so it might be blog posts. It might be designs on Instagram. It might be something on YouTube. Whatever it is, so it's your reputation preceding you. That's so that probative conversation, the first one, that's different from the three subsequent conversations, which are all person to person. They're all like typical sales conversation. Second conversation is the qualifying conversation where you're just vetting the lead to see if there's an opportunity here. Is this a good opportunity for us? Do they meet our financial threshold? Whatever other criteria we have about clients that we will and will not work with. Uh, once they're vetted, so they get past the qualifying conversation, the next conversation is the value conversation. And that's where you um, endeavor to set price based on the value to be created. Now, in the architecture profession, a lot of it's just a function of the, of the build price. And there, are other, um, there are things that you can't do that I would talk to an audience of designers and ad agencies about. But the value conversation is really, I, I think mastering the value conversation is the most valuable skill in business. Like aside from your, your domain expertise of architecture, the most valuable thing you could learn to do is to have a value conversation because the value conversation gets the focus on, ultimately we're trying to set price on value. So we're really trying to get to like, what is the value to the client of this? What, do, what is it that they want and what's that worth to them? Now, whether you set price on that or not, that's up to you. And then the fourth and final conversation is the closing conversation. It's where you facilitated a decision. You help facilitate a decision with the client on choosing the option that is best for them. Implied in that word option is this idea that your proposal should contain options, should contain different ways to engage us at different price points. So the probative conversation, the qualifying conversation, the value conversation, and the closing conversation. I really appreciate that outline. And we recently read a book, uh, They Ask You Answer in Context and Clarity, where it was fun because he's saying that the new way that people buy pools, because he sells, sells pools, um, it, is that they do all the research themselves. And now you've been in the business 20 years, it sounds like. And so have you seen a similar shift or is that just a write-off to get us out of trying to sell anymore? No, there's been a fundamental shift and it's driven by internet search. So it's like, it's, um, so the folks who wrote the challenger sale, um, they commissioned re research of some kind that back probably a dozen years ago, they said 56% of the purchasing decision is now made in all B2B sales. So this is B business to business is now made before there's any conversation with the salesperson. Wow. They think back in the old days, in, in the pre-web days, uh, having a conversation with the salesperson was a way to get industry knowledge, find out what competitors are doing, find out who's offering what, what the, um, you had to have these conversations with various salespeople. Now, as a buyer, you don't. You just go online and uh, most of the information that you're looking for is there. You can get a lot of the information that 
you need to select an architect based on what you see online. And then you can uh, winnow it down to uh, maybe one or two or three. And you have a lot more knowledge today about those, um, about those providers or experts that, than you did previously. So if you, so the big thing that's come out of that is um, lead generation used to be a function of sales. So this won't make sense for independent architects, um, but you, you understand the concept in a large, in a large business, uh, the responsibility for generating leads used to reside in sales. That was the job of the salesperson. So the smile and dial rejection proof salesperson is who we conjure up when we think of a salesperson and they needed to be rejection proof because they were just going through leads, 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 looking for like turning over rocks so they could find something to eat. And you wanted somebody that who was tireless at turning over rocks. Right. And then once they found something under a rock, now the skills required to navigate the sale, once you have a qualified lead, uh, they're actually quite different. So you want a high drive rejection proof salesperson to generate leads back in the old days. And then you want a calm, patient, discerning with some subject matter expertise salesperson to navigate people through the sale. Hey, we're experts. We do this all the time. Let me walk you through how this is going to work if you choose to work with us, especially later in the closing conversation. Closing is really about reassuring, calming people down because of what we've already talked about, people getting kind of worried, buyer's remorse setting in. So if you take, now that most people get most of their information from a buying point of view online, and they come to you, or at least this is how businesses are built today, the lead generation function has moved from sales to marketing. Mm -hmm. So that probative conversation is your reputation preceding you, it's through referrals, but also through the content marketing that you do, the reputation that you build out in the world, actually on the web, with the idea of driving leads to you with you already seen as the expert. So that we call it the flip, the moment in time you move from the vendor position to the expert position in the mind of the client, that's already happened. You drive inbound inquiries to you. So if once you take that, uh, the need for lead generation away from the sales function, our definition of what it means to sell and, and what a good salesperson looks like changes entirely because selling is now more like um, the, the, the personality profile of a good salesperson today is more like the profile of somebody who will deliver the expertise. They're calmer. They don't have, they're not super high drive. They're more patient. They have domain expertise. They can calm a nervous late stage client down and say, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. We've done this a hundred times before. Let me walk you through our model that explains exactly how we work so you can see yourself in it and you can determine, oh, this is a bulletproof process. Little variability in process equals little variability in outcomes. So there's a lot packed up into, <laughs> into what I just said, but the sales role absolutely has changed because of internet search. We no longer look to salespeople to drive leads in the way that we used to. Therefore, we don't have to hire these annoying people. Really good salespeople can be calm and patient and not always trying to talk people into things. I think that puts some people at ease right now, but, but, Okay, Blair, I am a small firm architect. It's, it's me and, and a 1099 working with me. I'm wearing 17 hats of the entrepreneur. Um, I don't like turning over rocks. I love being an architectural generalist. I rely mainly on referrals, almost completely on referrals, past clients, you know, my cousin, who's a contractor, things like that. What happens when things start to slow down? How do I, how do I ramp this back up? How do I, how do I engage what you're talking about in 2023? Uh, because I'm, I'm not the one, I'm not the high drive. I don't like flipping the rocks over. I, I can't stand people saying no to me. 
how do I keep this firm going? Yeah. So I'm the same way. I mean, I run a sales training organization. I've written a book on selling. I'm writing, a, writing another book on selling, but I, I don't like that, that looking for people to, it's like hunting. I, I don't yeah. like the lead generation aspect of selling. So when I launched my business 23 years ago, whenever it was 22 years ago, um, I had to make a decision. Well, if I don't like selling, then I'd better be very narrowly focused, right? I, I, better, I better narrow my focus so that I can build a depth of expertise rapidly. And those two things are correlated, right? It's broad expertise as an oxymoron. Maybe if you've had 30 years experience, you can get away with a broader claim of expertise. But if you really want to stand out and you really want to get found uh, via internet search, then you should narrow your focus. The, the more comfortable you are with the lead generation part of selling, the broader a practice you can get away with. And you also said, Jeff, like, okay, I, I rely on referrals. Well, when somebody says that they're in one of two camps, usually the latter, usually the second camp. Uh, the first camp is we have an active referral strategy. We've studied this and everybody we work with, we have a time when we ask and we have a format for asking and we're really good at soliciting referrals from our best clients and then closing on some of those referrals. There's almost nobody in that camp. Like the people who do this are, they're just at a, at a different level. Um, they do it almost reflexively or they've just been trained. They've just taught themselves or been taught by others. Always ask, here's how you ask, et cetera. Most people saying I rely on referrals are basically saying the fate of my business is in the hands of other people whom I can't name. That's pretty scary. Yeah, it's entirely it's scary. True, though. It's true. Yeah. 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 Dominate and, and we... niche. Dominate a niche. And yeah. then once you dominate a niche, then possibly think about expanding that niche. Going out, if you think of concentric circles, if the niche is typically defined by a discipline, so architecture, but a narrow dis discipline might be residential architecture, or it might be home office renovations. Like you, you get tighter. And then, so it's a combination of discipline and the market. So, yeah. sorry, it's discipline market. I think of market as verticals. They're not always verticals though. So yeah. what do you do and who do you do it for? And if you're finding the selling or the, the building of the business uh, difficult, generating enough leads difficult, then think about narrowing your niche. So when somebody, somebody's not just looking for architect, they're looking for residential architect Denver. So now it's only you and 120 other architects, <clears throat> or they're looking for uh, architect home office or what other variation you might think of. What happens when, um, what happens when I want to expand? I, I like to, so to maybe to to add a little a little tangible to what you were just talking about. One thing I like to encourage people to do is when they're thinking about their niche, narrow it down until you there's only ten people left. It gets really extreme and it scares architects to think like that. But you know it's. Hey, we design restaurants. Okay. Um, how many restaurants are there across North America? There are a lot. We, we, we design um, uh, independently owned restaurants. Suddenly it narrowed a lot. Uh, I'm in Indiana, in Indianapolis, which is in Indiana. So we design restaurants in Indiana, just dropped a lot. In Indianapolis, dropped a lot more. Um, independently owned farm to table restaurants with uh with 30 tables or less something like that and and some somehow we got down to to like 10 restaurants in the city of indianapolis that that applies to and now all of a sudden the architects are are terrified because they can't build a practice on that but my my thought was and i think this this ties to one of your proclamations if if there are only 10 people, today's Tuesday, if there are only 10 restaurant owners left in that mix, you can have a conversation with all 10 of those 
restaurant owners before the end of this week. And my theory is that if you do that, if you actually do that work and you have those conversations with those 10 owners, you suddenly know more about them and their business than any one of those individuals does because you've got the collective knowledge of those 10. And then I think it also starts to become easy to figure out how this expands back out because those 10, even though they're the, whatever, the farm to table independent 30 seats uh, in Indianapolis, they know the ones that are in Cincinnati and Chicago and all the other places that are like them. And they know the ones that have 40 seats instead of 30. And it, it's, if you're serving them at a high level, they're going to refer you to, to others in, in their network. But, but I think that really gets to, to um, I've got, a, I've got a cheat here. It's the, um, which, which one is it? Um, uh, da, 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 we will da, da, da. specialize the first proclamation. We will, yeah, it is, it is definitely, we will specialize. And, and, and also number four, we'll seek to better understand the client. I think it, I think it's both of those combined. Right. And I think that's, that's really powerful when we're able to do that. Ten, ten's too small. My my sphincter is tightened. That almost never happens. <laughs> um, because you have to do an assumption that you're only going to get what, like one or 2% yeah. of the market, only 5% right. of your client base or prospective client base is going to be in the market at any one time. Sure. Um, but, but the overall point that, um, so... I'm fond of saying the target isn't the market. The target is that at which you aim, aim and the market is that which you're happy to hit. So you think of if you're a golfer, mm -hmm. you aim for the pin, aim for the flag, and you're happy to land on the green. So you aim narrow. And if you make a narrow claim of expertise, um, those in related markets looking for related disciplines or looking for related disciplines will also find meaning in what you do. So we do sales training for creative professionals. Every few months, we have a public workshop of, of uh, tw 20 creative professionals show up to go through a four-day workshop. And as more time goes by, there's fewer and fewer creative professionals in there. There are people from creative or marketing firms. And then there are people who are just running AI businesses. There are consultants, there are staffing companies, there are accountants, there are financial planners, et cetera. And so what we don't do is broaden out our claim of expertise to say, um, we do sales training for all professional services and these, uh, we don't keep broadening out our claim of expertise. We lead with a narrow claim and our message gets exposure to, uh, people outside of our target market and then they come to us and sometimes they'll reach out and say, Hey, I'm, I'm not in your target market. Do you think there's a fit here? And we'll give them an honest appraisal and we'll say, of, we'll say like, it's, you're going to have to build, sorry, you're going to have to bend our material to your situation. So uh, the onus is on them, but like um, going off on a bit of a tangent here, it's like, it's, your claim of expertise should make you nervous. It's, it's the first test that you need to pass. Are you afraid? Because if you're not afraid when you try on narrowing your practice, it's probably not narrow enough. Now, you still, I don't know how to translate to this to an architectural business, but I, in a marketing services firm, you'd probably want to operate in a place that has between you know, in the low thousands of prospective clients just because of that math of, of uh, uh, not everybody's in the market at the same time and you're only going to get a percentage of that market when they are in the market. So you can do the math on, you can do the rough math. You probably need um, many hundreds. And even the, the farm to table example, there's probably nothing architecturally about a farm to table restaurant that's different from a non farm to table restaurant. So you have to be careful about the parameters that you use to define the specialization. Yeah. But yeah. that, that even Peter Thiel in his book, Zero to One, which I think might be the, the best like basic business book. It's called Zero to One Notes on, what is it? This running a startup or something. Um, he says, pick a niche, dominate the niche. Once you dominate the niche, then look for the ancillary markets, look to expand. Um, 
the other answer to your question, Jeff, of how do you, how do you grow? How do you expand your clients? <laughs> will grow your practice. Now, I don't know what repeat business looks like in an architectural space, but this works through referrals as well. So you have a declared expertise of X. This happens with us all the time, sales training for creative professionals. Somebody who's in our target market works with us, has a good outcome. They say to their friend who runs a management consultancy, hey, this isn't exactly your target market, but you should read this book because I think you would really benefit from this. So then they read the book and they decide, no, this applies to me too. So the market is always bigger than that value proposition that you are taking to your target market, which by definition is smaller. Yeah. yeah. I think so. there's some really good comments, if you don't mind me bringing one up that's related. Um, Bonita, kind of related to this idea of specializing, what if you have proven yourself as a specialist in an expertise but you're not what your client is expecting. If they're expecting a larger firm, it looks like uh, Benita is a sole practitioner. And so uh, the client gets turned off by that fact. How would you start to respond to that? So there's a binary situation here for the most part where either that smallness of your firm is actually a real impediment to you delivering the value that the client seeks or it isn't. And I suspect in the early days of every small business, um, that small business owner has this fear that they're, they're going to be found out about their size. And what you really, I had that fear too. What you really should do is just own it. Just absolutely own it. That fear is nowhere near as real as you think it is. And the way so many businesses work today is, just they have this ability to flex through 1099s, through other contractors, through partners, et cetera. So I would just proudly own the fact that you're a small firm. Um, but, you know, on the subject of objections, we, um, we have this point of view that, yeah, you want to learn to overcome objections, but you're better off creating, you're, you're better off being the party in the relationship that puts the objection on the table and ask the client to address it. So if you become aware of the fact that there is an objection, a potential reason not to do business together, you should put it on the table and ask the client to speak to it. So if you're getting this sense that the client really wants to work with a large firm early in the first conversation, you should say something like, hey, before we go too far, um, I get the sense that you're looking to work with a big firm. You need to know that I'm a solopreneur. pause. It's really important that you pause after that because whatever you hear next will be really important. So I said an objection is a reason not to do business together. You can also think of it as a gap in the, between what the client is looking for and what they think they're going to get from you. And you simply point out the gap. Now, most of you, you try this on, you think, well, that's why would I do that? You, you, want, to, you want to hedge your bet. You want to close the gap. You want to say, I'm a solopreneur, but you know, I'm confident in my ability to do the job. Don't say that. Just say, hey, it seems like you're looking for a big, a big firm. I'm a solopreneur. And the client might say, oh, well, I knew you're small. Like, I, I, assume, uh, I assume you have the, the ability to add like one or two other people. I don't think it would be too many people. It's not that big a project. And then so they start to close the gap and give you permission to close it the rest of the way. And you could say, yeah, we have lots of, lots of contractors we work with, lots of outside partners we could bring in. I've worked on projects larger than this before. It's absolutely not an issue from my point of view. It just seemed to me like it was an issue for you. So I wanted to speak to it. Or they might say, oh, oh, I had no idea. I thought you had 15 people. No, that's absolutely a deal killer. Well, if it's a deal killer, you want to find out now early on. Right? That's brilliant advice. And I think it goes to your point earlier. Uh, I think step number three is communicating your value and being able to leverage those skills and, and what you have going for you to your clients. I love it. Step number three is, not, is or uncovering the value to be created. That's an entirely different thing. Sorry. <laughs> That's really all about the client. What do you want? What does success looks like? What's the, what's this, what's, what's the value of this to you? 
of this new build. Well, the value is I come home, I feel relaxed. I feel I'm willing to entertain again. I'm happy to invite my family home for the holidays. That's the value. In a, in a B2B situation, there might be some economic value, but in residential architecture, all the value being created is entirely personal. What's the value of this to you? And if you can get the client to articulate the value, okay, that's what that's the goal. You want to get we want a nicely designed place that meets all these parameters that you've already listed. And the goal is for you to come home to feel relaxed, to feel empowered, to entertain again, to feel confident and joyful at having the family over for holidays. You want to build a place where family um gathers and you want to feel proud about it. If you get that out of the client and you repeat it back to them, they will feel heard. That's awesome. Um, another comment we had was, uh, how do you choose that expertise? How do you hone that blade to build that niche? Because I think another article you wrote, you were talking about responding to market conditions and like maybe be willing to question your business model during a recession. When do you choose to switch gears and how do you start to hone it? Are you responding to the projects that are coming your way? Are you responding to your personal passions or the market that you see available to you? Yeah, I, I think the first step is to look at the work that you've done historically, right? What, what's the work that's easiest for, for, for us to win and where maybe that's the most profitable? Start there, but then also when, once you've done, once you've finished mining your past, then there are other questions you can ask about your past, but look at what, you, what you've done historically. Um, once that's done, then... Um, then try a bit of a fast track strategy exercise and just ask yourself, like, what's missing in the marketplace? Like marketing, there are different definitions of marketing, but the one I heard over 25 years ago that really speaks to me, it's very similar mark definition to entrepreneurship. Marketing is looking at the market, asking yourself what's missing, and then matching a product or service to that need at a profit. That's the definition of marketing. So most people on this call, they're not marketers, they're producers. So those are the two main roles that you can play in business. You, you're either a marketer or a producer. A producer says, I know how, how to produce X chairs. In this case, it's architecture. I know how to design buildings. <clears throat> I'm going to open a business and hope that I can find a, a, a market. So producers struggle with marketing, marketers st str struggle with production. I forgot your question just went off on a tangent there. It, it was defining expertise. I think we did a good job of it. Uh, at least a start. It's a hard, it's a hard one to figure out. Um, we have another big challenge from Rick RFPs. And so this is very common, especially because, uh, when public money is involved, an RFP is required because that government entity and nonprofits are required to get competitive bids for even design services. So, I had a personal policy when I started my own business was that I wouldn't do a single RFP and I immediately broke that and I did get the project, but, uh, what, what is your advice <laughs> on the RFPs? So I, I did a speech many years ago now in, uh, I guess it was in Boston. My first question afterwards, somebody said, I was talking about RFPs <clears throat> and somebody said, I live in Washington, DC. All of my governments are, all of my clients are government and not-for-profit associations. What should I do? And my answer was move. Um, why would you do that? Why would you? Like, if you're at the it beginning is, of your yeah. business, why would you build the? Why would you build a business where you have to go through government RFPs? And now, okay, maybe your maybe it's your passion. Maybe public service is your passion, right? So. Um, you have to play the RFP game. Now, so Jeff, in the introduction, you mentioned I do a podcast called Two Bobs that I co-host with David C. Baker. I have a second podcast I launched a little over a year ago. It's called 20% The Marketing Procurement Podcast. It's a niche podcast where I and my co-host are interviewing procurement people from the world's largest companies. <clears throat> We're trying to solve the marketing procurement problem. So we get these procurement people giving away all the secrets. And in one of the first interviews we did, we had a procurement person say something I've always known to be true. He said, oh, I probably shouldn't say this, but um, 
by the time we go to RFP, over 50% of the time, we already know who we're going to work with. Yep. So, so just think about that. You should view the RFP as a game, right? It's a game and you're, you're trying to, um, you're trying to get the rules of the game changed in your favor. So let's pretend for a second that you're not focused on public sector, that you, it's mixed. Some is, some is public, some isn't. You're talking to a prospective client and they say, okay, this is great. You sound great. I'll send you the RFP. When you hear the letters RFP, you should respond like a robot. We don't typically respond to RFPs. Just use that line. It's, a, it's an objection with some leeway in it. We don't typically respond to RFPs. Now, you can't do that with, <clears throat> with government. Then you leave the silence and the client will say, well, why don't you? And whatever answer you want to give, whatever you, your answer was, Kate, Katie, I don't like them. What, they're a waste of time. They ask a lot of work. They push all the work to us. Um, we just don't find we win them. I don't think it's a good way to hire an architect. You know, what, there's a lot of like really valid answers. And so if you, if you push back and it can be a different type of objection. <clears throat> and in that situation, the client might say, well, I've got to get three bids. So see you later. Or they might say, if you've, if the probative conversation has, has happened through your agents, if you've built some reputation, if you are seen as meaningfully different, you might have some leeway here. You might have some leverage. So the client might say, uh, well, Katie, we'd actually really like to work with you, but there's no way we can do that without issuing an RFP. Okay. So now they're saying the right things. Now we want them to prove it. So we seek a behavioral concession. So we might say, okay, well, as a matter of policy, I don't respond to RFPs, but um, I'm willing to break it for you if you do this for me. So, so whatever this is, information that they haven't shared with others, access to decision makers when you're told access isn't allowed, um, you get to, instead of completing the document that they've sent to you, submit a standard credentials document. We can go on and on, but if you get any form of behavioral concession, you should see that as a sign that they see you as meaningfully different. And I've done a small study on this. Any behavioral concession, your odds of winning go from about one over two N with N being the number of firms under consideration to greater than one in two. So, and that's because it's a sign that they see you as meaningfully different. They're willing to bend the rules to you in, in a, in a little bit. And if you can extract a, a more considerable concession, um, like access to senior decision makers when you're told access isn't, isn't allowed, that's a big one. Then your odds go way up. You're almost guaranteed to win. They're saying to you, okay, we really want to work with you and we understand that you don't like this process. We'll bend it a little bit for you and we'll bend it a little bit more. So you should always be seeking a behavioral concession in an RFP. You should always be asking to be treated different in some small way at first, and then maybe ask for a little bit more and a little bit more. And you should see the granting of that concession as an invitation to proceed and a sign that you are more likely to win than you are to lose. And if you do not get the concession granted to you, you should take that as a sign that you are highly likely to lose. Yeah, I, I love all of that. And what I would add to that is, uh, and specifically to Rick, um, I did a workshop a month or so ago with Zach Waters from uh, Black Swan Risk Management. And we talked about the intersection between risk management and business development. And we, we talked specifically about RFP, the, the RFP process of procurement. And um, I, I, I love the statistic that you just that you just shared there, Blair, uh, because that's not one that I had. Um, but my encouragement for everybody in that workshop is, if we think about this in terms of a timeline, left to right, um, hey, the, 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 the board of trustees just said there's a project coming six or seven years down the road to the RFP to completion of the project. The more engaged you are at the left end of that, timeline the more likely you are to win and and this is i think that's the area where all 12 of these uh well i think i think all 12 of the proclamations um maybe 
maybe I'm a little bit off there, but that's that is definitely the realm where when when without pitching can play in the RFP process because the more more involved you are in the left, if if you if, if you're reading the business news and you see that an RFP came out, forget it. Don't even bother at that point, right? Yeah. If you weren't part of that conversation somewhere in the left of this timeline, forget about it. It's, it, it's, I, I would have said it, it's a, a crapshoot and, and the statistic that you just laid out player makes it even worse, right? You've got to, you've got to be involved. The, the niche, the, the specialization, the understanding of your client, all of those things combined with having conversations combined with the possibility of maybe even uh, being involved in the shaping of that RFP, all of that stuff to the left end of that timeline is critically important if you're going to play the RFP game. Absolutely. That's a great, that's a great question. I'm glad we were able to, uh, uh, to address that. That's a really good one. And I just realized we're past the top of the hour. So we've been going, going at this for a while. Um, Blair, have you got another three hours? Let's just keep going. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, this is, this is, this has been a joy. Lots of lots of great uh, uh, praise for the conversation already. Um, I really appreciate everything that you do, Blair. The the writings, the podcasts, the the uh, conversation. We didn't even mention the conversations with Chris Doe on uh, the the future F U T U R uh, YouTube channel over there. Um, all of it is fantastic. If you have never heard of Blair Ends before, I hope that you listen to this. Uh, conversation again. I hope that you check out Win Without Pitching. I hope you check out Price and Creativity, Two Bobs, 20%, all of these things, uh, because we all need to learn what Blair is sharing here and, and what he and Shannon train us to do in their uh, their training products over at Win Without Pitching. So let me just throw up, I forgot to do this, um, winwithoutpitching.com, bottom left of your screen right now. Go check out what they're doing over there. And uh, you, you definitely will not be sorry. Um, the other thing that I, I meant to touch on, which, but forgot, was that silence. That moment of, not even moment, just, just letting it lay there and letting it marinate. I heard you mention that, I think, in a conversation with Chris Doe. And I remember thinking, how hard is that? But how powerful is that? Just to lay it out there on the table and then wait for the other person to respond. Blair, That's you must really be great at poker. <laughs> 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 I don't have the probability down <laughs> quite yet. <laughs> He's a card counter. <laughs> um, so Blair, thank you for this conversation. It's been fantastic. Katie, as always, thank you for co-hosting this with me to all of you out there. Um, I've said this for three years now. Thank you for making context and clarity a thing because without you, without you showing up, without you wanting these conversations, we would not be talking to Blair Ends today. So thank you to all of you for this opportunity. Um, And I say this in closing every time, please be well, stay safe, keep those around you safe and well. Take a little bit of time to breathe, relax. We don't do this every day anymore like we used to, but we do this every week. You've got to find a way to rejuvenate, recharge, and get ready for the next conversation here. So uh, next week, having said that, next week on Context and Clarity Live, we will have Will Gardara, who is the author of Unreasonable Hospitality. That was the Context and Clarity Book Club book, I think March or February of this year. So I'm looking forward to talking with Will Gardara next week. Week basically about client experience. Uh, he comes from the restaurant world, so he would call it customer experience, but we can easily translate what he writes about in Unreasonable Hospitality into client experience. So that's what we'll talk about next week. Blair, again, thanks. Really appreciate you for this conversation. Uh, it's been fantastic. And we'll see everybody next week. Thanks. Thanks, guys.